Uh, so you should see it now. Let me just go full screen. Oh, the Mont Blanc slide decks. Okay, I think you should see it now. Perfect, yes, thank you. Okay, so hello everybody. Uh, my name is Bine Brank and I'm a PhD student at uh, ULIC Supercomputing Center. And today I will present some of the work uh, related to porting of applications to ARM-based processors. Uh, so if you go right into the introduction, Mm. So in the recent years, we have seen uh, more and more ARM-based architectures coming into the uh, HPC systems. So here are two examples. In 2018, Astra uh, became the first large-scale system to get listed on top 500. Uh, now this is based on Thunder X2 processor. Uh, recently this year, the Fujitsu revealed the A64FX processor, which is installed in Fugaku supercomputer. And we also, in Europe, we have a very strong EPI project, uh, which also aims to develop uh, high-performance ARM cores. Uh, so A64FX is the first processor to implement scalable vector extension, and we believe this is really the key for, for high-performance cores. Uh, now, with our paper, uh, we evaluated four HPC applications. So these are uh, Valberla, Mini FE, Nest, and Callisto. I will talk more about them in the next slides. So uh, doing that, we also ported uh, Valberla and Mini FE to include support for SVE. And then we analyzed the performance by either comparing it to some performance models where that was possible or, or to some uh, figures obtained with an x86 uh, platform. So here uh, are some of the platforms listed. So the evaluation was done on four different platforms. So uh, first we have HI 1616 processor, then Thunder X2. Then uh, during the Fujitsu's early access program, we were also able to access the A64FX processor. And then uh, for some comparison, uh, an x86 server uh, from Haswell generation. Uh, so some of the, of the compiler versions that we used are uh, so uh, ARM compiler for Linux 20.1, GCC 10.1, uh, Clang 10.0, and in case of A64FX, also the Fujitsu compiler 4.1. Uh, so here uh, we have listed the hardware parameters, so I do not have time to go into details here. Uh, perhaps the most important differences are the so simultaneous multi-threading for Thunder X2 and Xeon, uh, then rather large uh, throughput of SV, of floating point operations due to SVE uh, and of course the high bandwidth memory on, on, on A64FX. Uh, so going straight into the uh, benchmark and applications. Uh, so the first one, starting with the most simple one, which is stream benchmark, I think you are all familiar with it. So this is the default benchmark for measuring uh, memory bandwidth of a system. And as I will show, two of our applications are memory bound. So it was good to establish some baseline memory bandwidth. So here we use version 5.10. Uh, of course, array size was set big enough to, to exceed the cache size. And on, on A64FX, we also uh, enabled large memory pages. This, this uh, had uh, definitely had an effect. Uh, so here are some, so here are the results for stream. Uh, so on all platforms except HI-1616, we obtain between 70, 60 and 70% of the peak performance. Uh, now one thing to definitely note here is, so due to the uh, right allocate cache mechanism, the actual amount of data exchanged uh, uh, between CPU and memory is higher than what stream reports. So on ARM architectures, uh, it is actually able to we can bypass this uh, right allocate mechanism by first zeroing out the entire cache line. So if the cache line is empty, then we do not have to read before write. So we essentially save one read. So now uh, to our knowledge, the Fujitsu compiler is the only one who can ge generate these so-called DC zero instructions that do that. So on A64FX, we also, we also, took, uh, uh, we also uh, took advantage of that. So here in table one, you can see the results. Uh, of course, the A64FX uh, stands out in terms of memory performance, and this can even be uh, improved when we use the so-called DC0 instructions. Uh, so yeah, this here, 
uh, A64FX uh, much, much bigger bandwidth than, than the other three platforms. Uh, so going into the first, well, let's say real application, which is Valberla. So Valberla uh, comes from the domain of uh, computational fluid dynamics uh, applications. Uh, so it uses a lattice Boltzmann method. This is an iterative scheme where uh, each iteration is done in two steps. So first we have collision and then propagate step. Now the propagate step involves only memory operations. So overall, this is, this is uh, a memory bound application. Now in this context, we use the uniform grid benchmark, which is based on a D3Q19 model. And for this model, we can actually estimate the amount of uh, data transferred between CPU and the memory. So this is this formula here. So a brief explanation. So here V stands for the, well, volume, but it's actually a number of, of points in the grid. Then two due to collision and propagate step. Then 38 because for each point we, we load and store 19 values and eight bytes, uh, of course, for the double precision. So from that, we can get a pretty simple performance model for how many lattice points we update per second. Uh, for that, we simply divide the bandwidth measure to its stream uh, with the number of, uh, so the number of uh, bytes transferred for each lattice site. So this is this IMM divided by V. Uh, so in terms of porting to SVE, uh, so for Varbella, no specific changes were ne necessary actually. Uh, the support for SIMD instructions is, is done with uh, compiler auto-vectorization. However, for, for compiler to successfully vectorize uh, the, the update kernel, we had to use the specific compiler directives. So for ARM HPC compiler, we had to use clang loop vectorize assume safety. And for GCC, uh, GCC IV dep was used. So both these directives only assure to the compiler there that there are no uh, loop carry dependencies and that it's safe to, to vectorize uh, this sort of loops. And we can see that in table two, this actually has quite a big of effect. This table shows the fraction of SV instructions with and without compiler directives. And we see that using these directives actually uh, heavily improves the number of SV instructions. And so this table was uh, actually generated. The results in this table were generated with uh, ARMY. Uh, emulator. Uh, so here are some of the results. So for all for all platforms except Intel Xeon, the results are quite close to what model predicts. So on table three, we showed the uh, observed performance and the expected performance here. Uh, MUPS means million lattice updates per second. So clearly A64FX with, with HBM stands out in terms of performance uh, and it's about three times faster than Thunder X2. And now for Intel Xeon, uh, the performance is actually better than what the model predicts. Uh, this is something we still are currently investigating uh, why this happens. Uh, and then also, uh, so on figure two on the right side, there is a, a scaling plot. Uh, so on A64FX, and we see that for uh, all number of cores except one and eight, the, the measurement is actually quite, quite close to the model. Uh, going into the Next application, which is Mini FE. Uh, so Mini FE is, is a mini application for exploring uh, parallel programming models uh, for application based on finite element methods. So the, the linear system that uh, arises from finite elements is solved with the conjugate gradient method. Uh, now we know that the main computational task of the CG method is the computation of sparse matrix vector multiplication. So here we only focus on this part of mini FE. Uh, so if we neglect other parts of the CG solver, we can also estimate the amount of data transferred uh, to the CPU. So this is this formula here. So let me briefly explain it. So in order to store sparse matrices, we need to basically store three things. So we need to store uh, row offsets. This is this first term. So number of rows times four. Then second uh, part, we need to store the column indices for each element. So this would be the number of non-zero elements times four. Uh, and then for, we actually need to store the, the actual coefficients. So this would be number of non-zero elements times eight for double precision. So here, uh, row offsets and column indices are, are stored as four byte uh, integers and 
the coefficients as, as, as in double precision. So in the solver for each iteration, we need to load the entire matrix uh, from memory. So this, we get a pretty simple model, uh, which, which then we can use uh, to estimate the performance. Uh, so in terms of porting to SVE, uh, so here, uh, the default format for storing matrices in mini FE is the so-called uh, compressed sparse row mate format. So this would be this one. Uh, now we know that this, this format can be quite inefficient when we have uh, wide uh, CMD units, as in the case of A64FX. Uh, this is due to its uh, row-wise data layout. So the better is the so-called LPEC format, which stores elements uh, column-wise, but even better is the sliced LPEC format, which first partitions the row uh, to slices and then stores for each slice uh, column-wise. So this would be the, on, the, on, the, on the right side. So uh, here we actually implemented this uh, sliced LPEC format, uh, but this was done, uh, well, let's say with a, with a slight twist. So here we actually use the vector length agnostic approach in which the, the length of each slice, so this part, is actually equal to the uh, size of the SVE unit. So this is something not done, uh, not known at compile time. This is only uh, known at runtime, which, what is the length of each slice. So for A64FX, this was uh, eight elements. So if we go into the, uh, the sparse matrix multiplication uh, kernel, which was uh, optimized with intrinsics, so here we see that uh, in the line three with the first for loop, we go through all the slices. So in this case, we have four, four slices. And then in another for loop in line five, uh, we go through all uh, columns of, of, of each slice. So here, uh, then we, in line six, we load the coefficients uh, into the into the SVE register, uh, then in line seven and eight, we load the elements from the vector. This is done with the load gather instruction. And then we simply uh, multiply and add the results to the, to the vector. And then of course we store the result. So this, this has a great benefit that if we here choose the length of each slice to be the same as the SVE unit, then all these SVE registers will be completely filled uh, throughout the algorithm. Uh, so going into the results, uh, so on all platforms we obtained uh, between 75 and 90 percent of the peak performance. So here on table four you have the the observed and the uh, expected uh, time spent in the matrix vector multiplication, and we see that again the A64 FX is so of course lower is better is is much faster than the other platforms. Uh, and on figure four, we actually, we show also the comparison between different uh, matrix formats used on A64FX. So the blue line is what the model predicts the minimum, minimum time spent in matrix vector multiplication. So with slice LPEC optimized with intrinsics, we get quite close to this, uh, to this uh, minimum time. But for a compressed sparse row or even sliced LPEC not vectorized with intrinsics, we get around four times uh, uh, lower performance. Uh, so going into the next application, which is Nest. Uh, so Nest is a simulator for spiking neural network models. Uh, each simulation is performed in two steps. So uh, in first, the network is built by, by uh, randomly connecting uh, a certain number of neurons. And then in the second, we actually perform the simulation. So this is the time dominating part. Uh, now here we use the HPC benchmark, which comes with Nest, and we set number of neurons to 22,500 and number of connections to 250 million. Uh, now here it is quite difficult to predict performance of Nest. So this is due to various reasons. Uh, so we have quite complex uh, control flow. Uh, the memory accesses are, are random and not so many computations are done for, for each connection. So here we also rely to some uh, figures obtained within x86. Now, if we go into the result, uh, so here are some of the, the most important results. Uh, so in table five, we have the, 
we have the execution time of build and simulation phase. Uh, and on figure five, we have the scaling results. So we see that uh, Thunder X2 and Xeon actually perform better than uh, A64FX and high silicon. Now we observe that when using two threads, uh, the Thunder X2 and Xeon uh, benefit significantly from, uh, uh, from simultaneous multi-threading. So in this context, we also define the scaling efficiency as time uh, needed for two, two cores at, divided by time needed for all cores. And this is also shown here. So, uh, so A64FX and high silicon uh, scale a bit better. And now uh, to obtain a better understanding of, of this significant differences between the single thread performance results, uh, we measured the number of back and stall cycles. So in figure six, we show the uh, proportion of cycles with a back end stall for uh, each respective machine for A64FX and for Thunder X2. And we see that for a small number of threads, the A64FX, the proportion of stalls is, is eight times bigger than, than for Thunder X2. Uh, now this gets smaller with, with bigger number of threads, but here uh, the, the large memory latency of HBM memory is, is the main reasons for, for poor performance of A64FX. Um, so then the, the last application is the Callisto. Uh, so Callisto is an application for rapid transcript quantification. Uh, it has two stages for processing RNA sequencing transcripts. So first we construct the index table by building uh, the brewing graph from all length K nucleotides. And then we read the sequencing data. We decompose it into this uh, K length polymers. And then the corresponding path is found in the graph with the help of the index table. Uh, so the execution time is typically limited by performance and efficiency at which data is read. So here we use the version of Callisto, which, which uses memory mapped IO. Uh, this has the benefit for allowing the parallel data access. Uh, but since all four servers uh, feature significantly different IO subsystems, subsystems uh, here for benchmarking purposes, we have uh, preloaded all data into the memory. So we use the human genome, which contained uh, 34 million reads. Uh, now, uh, here are some of the results for Callisto. So table six and seven show the results for all platforms. So on left are with, obtained with GCC and on the right with uh, ARM HPC compiler. So here for reference, we also showed the time spent in IO. This was measured with a benchmark that mimics the IO uh, behavior of Callisto. So we see that the time spent in IO is, is similar for all platforms. Now here also uh, we can observe significantly different execution times when using only one thread. And again, as with Nest, we have analyzed the execution of Thunder X2 and A64FX. And we again noticed that the A64FX had bigger number of, of back and stall cycles. So on average, uh, we found that on Thunder X2 for each, uh, for each uh, uh, polymer red, we only had 10 uh, back and stall cycles and on A64FX we had 55, so five times more. Uh, so again, the, the, the latency uh, seems to be crucial here. Uh, but when, when we go to the bigger number of cores, then, then A64FX uh, actually starts to perform much better. And uh, uh, so here in the last column, we have time for the let's say best uh, number of, of threads. And we see that uh, Thunder X2 is still slightly faster than A64FX, but uh, those are much faster than high silicon and, and Xeon processor. Uh, so a brief summary. Uh, so in our paper, we evaluated four, four applications with different characteristics. Uh, now in case of memory bound applications like Valberla and Mini FE, uh, we discover considerable improvement due to uh, high memory bandwidth and with the availability of SVE, this can be fully exploited. Now, currently we still observe uh, less good performance on A64FX for applications with uh, complex control flow and irregular data access. So here it still uh, seems crucial to look for some optimizations uh, related to latency hiding. Uh, maybe a slight remark on compilers. So compilers 
uh, Clang, GCC, and, and uh, ARM HPC compiler performed very similarly. Maybe there was a slight edge for ARM HPC compiler when compiling uh, Valberla and Nest. But no, no real uh, uh, conclusions can, can be made here. Uh, so thank you. With this, I would, I would end my presentation now. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm, I'm happy to, to try and answer them. Thank you very much. I think in the interest of time, we have maybe time for one quick question. Uh, perhaps I'm missing something. The only question I see at the moment is related to the stream, which I did not see presented here. So perhaps that was meant for another presentation. Here's a question. Is the bottleneck, oh, oh dear. I'm sorry, I've had a, there we go. Is the bottleneck memory latency or short out of order pipeline on the A64FX? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we believe that that is uh, due to memory latency. So uh, HBM memory has somehow a higher latency than, than on other machines. Uh, but this is still very uh, a work in progress. So uh, for now, we think it's, it's memory latency. And the other question was, um, is huge pages or transparent huge pages enabled for stream? And what was the page size? Oof. Uh, so this was, I think it was, well, I have to check. Uh, yeah, this was also uh, so uh, suggested by by the Fujitsu uh, people to enable this uh, with this uh, environmental variable to, to access huge pages. Now, it did have some effect, but I'm not sure I, I'm not sure what was the, the page size. Maybe some, some people from Fujitsu can answer this uh, with this, uh, with this uh, environmental variable set.